Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our very first Bushfire Preparedness webinar. My name is Erin Hutchins and I'm the coordinator of Emergency and Ranger Services here at the Shire of Dardana. In preparation for the fire season, we thought we would get creative and try something new to engage and support our community as traditional methods were becoming a little lacklustre. Coupled with the increase and in severity of fire events in the last few years across Australia, we believe sharing knowledge and sparking conversation would be a better way. Increasing our resilience to emergencies, such as bushfire, is a shared responsibility that we can all do together. Today, we have a variety of presenters sharing their expertise on bushfire preparedness with us all. First, I'll hand you over to our Business Solutions team leader, Zach, for a little housekeeping before we get started. Thanks, Aaron. Hi, everybody. I'm running back from behind the camera here. I'm the guy behind the camera pressing all the buttons. I'm, I'm Zach, I'm the Business Solutions team leader here at the Shire Dardner. Just wanted to go through a couple of things for you today and how we're gonna run the session so that um, any technical difficulties can be dealt with and um, we're able to um, help you out uh, with your questions that you might have. So if you're experiencing problems, the best way to get in contact with me is my mobile. Get me on 0428 738 254. If you give us a call, I'll talk you through any issues that you're having. Um, just need to let you know that we are recording the session. So um, we'll be using this to put on our website later on so other people can view it. Um, there's a couple ways that you can ask questions in today's session. You have the option to use the chat window in Zoom. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Zoom given COVID that's just happened, but you'll see it at the bottom of the, the video, there's a chat window. You just click on that, put your question in, and uh, we can address that. The second option is to use the raise your hand uh, functionality in Zoom. You'll see that um, at the bottom as well. And if you click that button, I'll know that you have something to say. And the third one is just old school, write it down on a piece of paper. And when we come to the end of a presentation or the Q&A session at the end, then um, we can uh, unmute you and let you ask that question. We will be stopping for questions at the end of each presentation. So you have the option to ask a question then, or you can save them up for the Q&A session um, right at the end. Uh, I think that's everything I wanted to go through. So um, once again, thank you for joining and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, the information about fire safety today. Thank you, Zach. Now I'd like to welcome our Shire President, Councillor Michael Bennett, for the Welcome to Country. Thanks, Erin, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, I'll just do uh, the acknowledgement of country and then I'll just uh, thank our presenters, if that's all right, Erin. Um, the Shire of Dardanup wishes to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Noongar people. In doing this, we recognise and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this region and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, Aaron, just uh, I'd like to thank you and the, uh, the team under the Sustainable Development Di Directorate uh, for putting today together uh, a great initiative something that's really fantastic for, for our Shire to be able to get out and uh, let people know how they can help in, in uh, before bushfires happen. We don't want them to help after they happened or during, we don't want them to happen. So uh, thanks to all the presenters, really appreciate the effort that you're putting in today uh, on our behalf and for our community. So thank you to you all and I hope you have an enjoyable uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Now, without further ado, we will turn over to our very first presenters, our Chief Bushfire Control Officer, Chris Hines, and FCL of the Ferguson Volunteer Bushfire Brigade, Rick Stacey. Thanks, thanks, Erin. Um, it's a, a privilege to participate in today's uh, activity, and, and particularly with my team member here, Mr. Chris Hines. Uh, Chris is a very um, experienced firefighter at both firefighting level and a, con a fire control level in our district and has also worked extensively in fires around the state. So in a moment, uh, we'll be uh, picking his brain, so to speak, on some key issues that uh, landowners need to be concerned with uh, in the immediate future for the upcoming fire season. Uh, so this section is called Message from the Chief. And the, the way we'll do this is I'll ask Chris a number of questions on your behalf and then we'll open up to the general public if, if, that's, uh, if that's okay. 
Now, Chris, what are your thoughts on, on the current fire season? How is it shaping up? Yeah, it's certainly shaping up all right. We've got a, a nice end of the season with a, a lot of good rain. So there will be seen out in the paddocks. There's a lot of long, lush grass and uh, people are starting to mow up now and turn into hay. And there's going to be still a lot of fuel left out there. Um, grass doesn't get turned into hay. And that's all going to turn into a nice uh, fire of um, carrying fuel. Um, yes, yeah, it's going to be an interesting year. We have our La Nina for this, um, this season. And that's going to uh, present us with varying types of weather conditions. Uh, well, just a steady hot summer and then uh, really excellent. Okay, so, so like most fire seasons in our area of habits uh, challenges, um, I guess it doesn't matter whether we have late rains or early rains, every fire season in our region is, is a challenge, that's for sure. Uh, you mentioned about haymaking, of course, in some of our areas, uh, Haymaking does reduce the fuel load, but of course, in my own area, for example, in the Ferguson district, uh, our area is characterised by a mixture of uh, rural subdivisions, uh, rural land, rural subdivisions, small holdings, um, combined with very steep terrain, uh, strong easterly winds in the summer, and so on. So even though there's a lot of fire removal, we rely very heavily on our landowners to um, do as much preparation as possible. Now, in the case of it, well, when people are predicting their uh, fire risk, Chris, uh, some people take comfort in the fact that they're, they're a reasonable distance away from forested areas or farm areas, for example, in our Eden subdivisions. What are your thoughts on that? Do they, do they need to be worrying about fire preparation? Yeah, we all need to be worried. Um, yeah, certainly uh, in the uh, town sites of Eden, we are surrounded by bush and, and a lot of grasslands as well. So, uh, Probably about eight years ago, we had a pretty good fire we impacted from the uh, from the uh, south across the forest highway. And that forest highway is quite a, a large uh, bit of um, cleared land, but uh, the fire made it quite across that that highway within probably fifteen minutes of the starting. Um, and and is that bro broaching of the highway? That's not due to direct flame contact, is it? It's due to I presume ember. Ember attack. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the fire starts off out in the bush. Don't take long to travel with a good wind behind it. And you've got the top of the trees and blowing a lot of sparks across the road and dropping your people backyards and um, there's a lot of panic going on there. So potentially with, with adverse conditions like a strong easterly, um, what sort of distance should we be worrying about uh, ember attack? Are we talking metres or kilometres? I've seen kilometres. Uh, I was at the uh, cool up fires uh, probably seven years ago. Um, and I saw a, a spot fire start about like five kilometres down the hill from where we were, um, uh, and then daytime turned to nighttime. So it can happen very, very quick. So the so the message in that for landowners is that uh, under the right or under the wrong conditions, under adverse conditions, we can get uh, spot fires some kilometres up to five kilometres possibly ahead of a fire front. So uh, even though you consider the direct fire front a risk, uh, you may be at risk long before a fire front gets anywhere near your property. So, uh, and that's why we have an appropriate warning system, which will be discussed later on in, in the seminar as well. So in the case of a fire, um, how does one rely on, or do, can one rely on someone knocking on the front door and saying, you've got a problem? Well, it's handy if somebody can come and personally greet you, but it um, doesn't always happen. For various reasons, the fire may have evolved too strongly, and um, it's too uh, dangerous for anybody to come in and knock on your door. Um, the alert system, you know, like could be the uh, could have happened right near the you know, communications tower, could have been affected by a fire. You may not have communications, so you need to be aware of what's going on. You know, don't just rely on your mobile phone to uh, tell you it's time to get out. You, you need to be across it, you know, be aware. Listen to your radio, ABC is a fantastic uh, tool there that uh, gets that message out to the community saying that there is something in your area and you need to prepare and don't uh, wait for nothing at all. Yes, and indeed, it's probably the best Christmas present you could buy yourself is a small battery powered radio. We rely very heavily these days on mobile communications and on the internet, but the reality is that uh, those services can drop out quite rapidly fire as they did in the Yalu fire, Chris, they, they dropped yeah, out for a long time. It did, I witnessed that. I was at the Yalu itself and uh, yeah, trying to get information back to control and uh, the phone was just kept on dropping out. So it was rather frustrating and uh, 
um, and you know, combined with the uh, radio traffic, things do get rather hectic. So, uh, yeah, you certainly can't rely on um, your mobile phone your tool and you get communications out. So we've had official advice from Telstra at one of the meetings here that uh, generally only have two to three hours of uh, mobile communication after the power goes out. So for any fire, a fire that's going to last in length of time, and typically dangerous fires are lasting for days, it means you may be out without mobile communications for a long time. So that's where your battery power radio comes in handy because the trusty ABC continues to broadcast under all sorts of conditions. So make sure you tune in to 684am uh, from Bustleton. I think that uh, probably applies to most of our district uh, for your latest uh, information on fire situations. So when a, when a fire brigade is called out, Chris, what, what priorities do we have? Are we, are we most concerned about livestock or buildings or you know, what, what, what's the key priorities? People. People's are my first priority. Make sure they're safe. Uh, and then we can deal with property, property can be replaced. Uh, stock, lot, livestock, same thing. You know, we certainly want to get them moving on, but this is part of the knowing what's going on. If, you, if there's a fire in the area, don't wait for the fire to get there. Or if they're moving the uh, horses or something, you need to be onto that early, you know, the day before, especially if there's a, uh, an emergency, a, a warning put out that uh, you have potential fire weather, you need to be making, taking action, not wait for it to happen. That's right. I'd, I'd like to back that up. I mean, that's my observation. Early in a lot of fires, we're faced with a lot of traffic on the roads, with horses being moved around, livestock. Um, the reality is in a fire, you're going to have to make difficult decisions about your own personal safety first and your livestock, pets and various other things. And you need to make realistic uh, decisions about that. So as, as Chris mentioned, human safety is the key priority. Infrastructure and the natural environment is still important but it's personal safety, including the personal safety of the firefighters. Chris, Chris would be reluctant to send crews into areas or buildings or houses where he feels that the firefighters would be put under particular stress. So on that, on that basis, uh, the, the firefighting groups around and there's nine, nine districts in our, our shire, each with a fire control officer, Chris is our chief. We're all available to provide support and help uh, with your fire mitigation and fire planning. Of course, we get involved in, in lots and lots of training uh, on that very, very subject as well. And here you can see on the slides a, uh, a mock up of an area of the Darden Up Shire, I think, Chris. Yeah, just trying to recognise where it is. That was the first. Uh, so this is the training for our fire control officers and captains, and these people are responsible for the day to day management of fires when they break out. So they're making decisions about where to deploy appliances, uh, what extra support they need, of course, control of things like power lines and other infrastructure. It's quite a complex, complex business. So the, the question is that on our next slide, we deal with the fact of how can you assist us in uh, our efforts in firefighting and fire prevention. And, and the greatest assistance you can provide with us is you doing your planning. Yeah, okay, we're off. So welcome back, uh, folks. Um, we're just discussing how, as uh, landowners, you can assist your local fire brigade in um, dealing with uh, fire, fire risks. Uh, we talked about uh, planning design, and that'll be addressed later in the seminar. Um, it's very important, of course, that we deal with the compliance issues, fire breaks, and so on. And if you look at the existing slide, you can see we've got a, a very good example of a, a proper fire break there. And of course, what makes the great fire break, Chris, is that it's got bare earth, isn't it? Got bare earth, and just plain room for that big truck to get through. That's right. We need we need bare earth to prevent the fire propagating, and we need room for trucks of that sort of scale. And you can see there we've got uh, four meter wide, four meters high. Just to clarify, the four metres wide doesn't have to be bare earth. We only need two metres of bare earth, but we need a tunnel to drive through that's four metres high by four metres wide uh, so that the truck can comfortably turn corners, get in and out. Because it's very important that if, if Chris or myself or another fire control officer is going to send a truck down a driveway or down a fire break, we need to know that that truck can come out again safely. But our, our key priority is keeping our firefighters safe, and that helps us keep you safe. So uh, what I'd uh, 
remind you as landowners that you, know, you need to have realistic expectations about fire and make sure that you're prepared and we'll deal with ways of doing that preparation. But the thing that I really, is really, really important that I've just mentioned is that we need to design our access and so on to keep our firefighters safe. Uh, they need access, they need to be able to get in and get out safely, hopefully with a turnaround at the end of a driveway. Uh, water supply locally on your property, property will help and you need to be prepared. So at this stage, we'll just look at a brief video on that slide, which is uh, a brief video of um, a truck moving around the property. Thanks, Zach. Yeah. What the video would be showing <laughs> if we had it. Oh, here we go. Okay, Zach's just getting the video organised. This this video is taken uh, from some uh, fire scenes up in the Mandogalup area. It's a lovely sunny day, no smoke at ground level. It's a good fire. Here we go. I just get the sound. <laughs> you can help us this bushfire season. This is just one. Can we fit into your driveway? one? We can't fit, we can't help. Before this bushfire season starts, make sure your driveway is clear of obstructions. Allow four metres high and three metres width so that fire trucks can easily get through to defend your home. Wet was fire ready, are you? Thanks, Zach. So you can see the message there is pretty straightforward, Chris. Access is the key thing, is it not? It sure is. Uh, our trucks can't get in there. How can we come defend your property? Uh, you might as well. You'll be on your own. So uh, don't depend on us if you haven't prepared your driveway. At the same time, we only have so many trucks too, so that's why you need to prepare yourself. Have your hoses, your, your water supplies, anything that you can use to put a fire out, be prepared. Um, you, you might not be able to get there every time. Now you mentioned, Chris, <laughs> that um, there's only limited resources. Just to give uh, listeners an idea, how many appliances do we have in the Dardanelle Shire? So we have nine. So we've got a total of nine appliances uh, with crews. So you know you do do the arithmetic. How many properties there are in the Darden Upshire? Um, there's no guarantee that a vehicle or appliance will end up at your property, but clearly the fire control officer will be making decisions about where to deploy those resources. So the easier you can make access, uh, the more likely it is that we can help you. If access is limited uh, or if there's a danger. Uh, the fire control officer has no option but to perhaps choose to not enter that that property. So that, that's something that, to keep in mind. And finally, we'd like to finish off with the final slide in this section, which is about expectations about what happens in a fire. Uh, and this is a, a message that's been presented to the public for years, you know, whether you stay or leave. Um, it seems it seems like an easy decision to make, but it is perhaps the most difficult decision you will ever make. And clearly it's not a decision to be made during a fire. During a fire, you'll be stressed. You won't have the energy and time to make rational decisions. These sorts of decisions need to be made up front. You need to know your trigger points where you or your family need to leave. And of course, Chris, if you're already away from home and a fire breaks out, what, what's the consequence there? Can you get back to your home? You may not be able to get back home. Uh, so you need to have a plan. You can't get home. What are you going to do? You need to be prepared. You know, your stock, how are they going to be fed? You know, your children, they're trying to get home on the bus. You need to have a plan. What are you going to do? You might, you might have to go to somebody else's property for the night. So you need to plan ahead. That's right. The general public's got to appreciate that uh, fires, uh, roads are generally closed in fires to prevent people entering properties illegally and also to keep people safe. We can't have uh, landowners going back into a fire area 
Uh, as you can see from this slide, uh, that's that's a reasonably calm looking fire front there, but it would be irresponsible of us to allow you to enter a fire zone. So just be aware, if you're away from home when a fire breaks out, it's very unlikely that you'll get access back until there's an all clear in the area. And we'll talk about those various fire ratings later on. So in other words, you need to prepare your property as if you're not going to be there. So you've got to ask yourself, is your fire or is your property resilient to fire? Have you done the appropriate planning? Have you done the appropriate work? And you need to be able to survive not being home and consider that you've done the best that you can to protect your property. And of course your property affects the, the adjoining properties as well. You need to make some hard decisions about priority stock, horses, pets, chooks, whatever, kids, whatever, family. Um, now, we're, just, we're going to finish off with a movie. It's only a one minute movie. Um, just a, a warning on this movie, it's quite confronting. It deals with some scenes, um, they're realistic scenes. It's a dramatization, but it's realistic. And it deals with three families in three different situations, which is quite typical. So we'll kick off with this movie. Um, if you've recently been through a fire and you're suffering some trauma, it would be worth not looking at this video. We'll, we'll let you know when the video is off because you'll find it re-traumatizing, I'm sure. Um, but I make no apology for choosing this video because I think it's very important that we give you a realistic impression of what happens during a fire. Fires are totally unpredictable, are they not, Chris? They can arrive, they don't arrive during the day generally, they arrive at night in the dark with choking smoke. So this is a video I think produced by uh, the fire authorities in New South Wales. Here we go. Thanks, Zach. We planned to stay. But we never thought it could reach us here. It wasn't me, the horses. We planned to leave. Ask yourself, how fireproof is your plan? So as you can see, a confronting movie, but I think an essential message that you need to be very clear as to when you will leave and not leave it too late because the road, I believe Chris would be perhaps the most unsafe place to be in a fire. It is, it's certainly a uh, scary place to be. I've been in that situation many a time. And uh, if you're not prepared for it, or don't even don't appreciate what's going on, uh, you're at big risk. Um, you go to one state to control and calm uh, when you are in those environments and uh, you're not been uh, exposed, that's sort of thing. It's going to be very hard to be composed and uh, keep, keep, keep control. And what are your thoughts, Chris, on, on taking a trailer out with you if you did try to escape a fire? Oh, yeah. Like the people just then, how are you going to turn around with a trailer stuck up behind you uh, in smoke? You, know, you can see that vehicle, but normally in, in a fire like that, you can't see the cable set or the, the lights in your car. So, yeah, not smart. That's right. So as soon as you as soon as you add a trailer to a vehicle, it, it um, reduces your flexibility considerably. You could find yourself stuck. And statistically, if you look at deaths in things like the Esmonds fire and so on, um, look through the case studies, you'll find that trailers do contribute to to the risk. Yeah. So uh, I know it's a, it's a negative note to, to finish on, but hopefully um, we've given you some insight into uh, some of the things you can do to. Um, uh, ameliorate your fire risk this summer. We look forward to working with you to keep you safe and to keep us safe and uh, to see you, um, see you during the summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris and Rick. We always appreciate your time sharing your wealth of knowledge with us all. Um, Zach, did we have any questions? Uh, no questions in the chat just yet. Um, no. Sure, no worries. We'll keep moving then. Next, we have the captain of our Wellington Mills Volunteer Bush Fire Brigade, Keith Hyam, who will share his experience from deployment to the 2019 Eastern States Black Summer Fires. 
Hi, thanks, Aaron, for the introduction. Um, yes, as Aaron said, my name is Keith. Um, I've been a volunteer firefighter for about six and a half years. I'm married with three beautiful kids under the age of 10. So my life is quite hectic uh, beyond the demands of fire season. Um, as a volunteer, you need great support from your family um, and employer to do what we do. I'm lucky enough to have both. Uh, I'd like to share some stories from my experience of the black summer in New South Wales. There are lots of stories. There isn't time to share all of them today. I've tried to keep it to a few that might help um, others better understand the risks that we face in our beautiful part of the world now and into the future um, you know, to, to keep yourself and your family safe. Uh, so last summer I was deployed to New South Wales on two separate occasions uh, in November and January. Uh, very early in November there wasn't a huge amount of media coverage, um, at least in Western Australia, about what was going on in New South Wales. Uh, I was in Sydney only a couple of weeks prior to being deployed and I don't remember hearing anything um, even in New South Wales about the situation that was developing. I can sort of remember hearing some stuff on the news um, and social media but I hadn't thought it was anything out of the normal at that point. Um, one Friday afternoon I remember getting a text message from Chris uh, regarding a possible week-long deployment to New South Wales. Now, I've, I thought that'd be a really good opportunity for me to get some more experience prior to our own season kicking off. I discussed it with my wife who was supportive of the idea. I filled out some paperwork and sent this back to Chris and from there it all happened very quickly. Um, the following Monday I was advised that I'd been selected um, and had to sort of wrap up my normal, normal life things uh, in a hurry, trying to get clearance from work. Um, you know, telling the kids what was going on. Um, and then on Tuesday, uh, I met up with the rest of my strike team in Perth and we flew out on Wednesday morning. So you can see it was fairly quick. Uh, the team comprised of a few other volunteers from the Southwest, uh, but also volleys from Lower Southwest, Great Southern, Goldfields, Metro, uh, and Midwest, along with a couple of experienced career officers from DFES. Uh, there really wasn't much detail on what, uh, where we were going or what sort of work we would be doing. Um, we landed in Brisbane and we got a bus back across the border into northern New South Wales. And, and a lot of what I remember about that trip was it was a, it was a five hour trip from Brisbane Airport to Cleanliness. Um, and there was heavy smoke for the whole five hours. To put it into perspective uh, of what we what we saw when we got there, the 2016 Yarloop fire uh, burnt approximately 70,000 hectares of land. Uh, the Stockyard Creek fire, which I was at, grew almost 60,000 hectares over the 8th and 9th of November um, when it merged with uh, some other fires burning in the area. The weather conditions were extreme over those two days. Um, above 40 degrees, winds to 50 kilometres an hour. Uh, combine this with fuel that is super dry from a couple of years of very, very low rainfall. Um, it was the perfect mix for a very high intensity, very dangerous fire. You know, this monster of a fire, we had flame heights at the top of the, to the canopy. Um, you know, Chris spoke about spot fires before. We were seeing spot fires starting 10 kilometres ahead of the fire front. Um, there's nothing that can be done to stop fires in those conditions, even for the most well prepared. Uh, I've never been to a fire where there's been properties and life lost. There was properties and life lost. Um, firefighters were seriously injured. Um, yeah, we, uh, a resident um, in the area we were looking after was killed um, when they stayed too late. Um, for the week we were there, our tasking was to protect life and property. We're safe to do so. Um, you know, that was mostly during the day and then trying to get some back burning done at night to try and get in front of the fire. Um, we used very, very little water. There was no water available. Um, we, you know, we, were, we were told that uh, water is purely for protection of life only. Um, you know, we worked hard as a group of WA fires. We, we made friends with a lot of the local RFS guys over there. Um, you know, we were a bit of a novelty for them, I think, uh, being from WA. 
in those conversations, you start to get some insight into what's been going on um, in New South Wales leading up to that point and how stretched the resources were. There were there were fires that were on their they weren't on their first deployment, they're on their second and third deployments two months into the into the fire season. Um, I remember a conversation with the captain of the local brigade whose name was Chris. Um, he was the incident commander at this fire. Um, and at the point in time that we were there, he'd, he'd been working on fire every day for two months already, and this is early November. Um, Chris was a guy who ran his own construction business. He hadn't been on site for two months. Um, he'd only been home to sleep um, and shower. Uh, luckily enough, his wife was also a brigade member and she was sitting in the seat in the Land Cruiser next to him the whole time or, you know, um, under similar circumstances, I think a lot of volunteers would end up divorced, unemployed and um, without a house. Uh, that same week, New South Wales declared a state of emergency and um, things really started to ramp up. Um, I think it took me a while after I got back to really process the experience that I'd had. Um, it wasn't for a few weeks that, you know, it started to become a bit clearer to me. Um, certainly, I'd learned some new things about firefighting, uh, particularly dry firefighting um, and leading crews. Uh, but meanwhile, on the ground in New South Wales, things were going from really bad to diabolical. Um, it was all over the media in a similar way to what COVID is currently. Um, I found myself watching that on the news a lot. Um, I understood from my deployment that the locals were very stretched. Um, we had, you could see strike teams from all over the country being deployed to assist. Um, and then the Americans and Canadians started to get involved as well. Um, being at home, I, I had that real sort of emotional connection to what I was seeing on TV. But given the impact my first deployment had had on my family and my work, um, you know, I wasn't wasn't really thinking about going that at that stage. Um, yeah, it had felt like I'd done my part. Um, you know, then something changed and um, this image for me was uh, what, what changed it for me. It was, it was like the sky had fallen in the first time I saw it. Um, when you listen to people talk who've been impacted by fire, um, you might hear them talk about, you know, the flames or the smoke of, of going black in the middle of the day. Um, the roar of the fire like a jet engine. Um, you know, that's not something that I really remember from some of those situations. Um, but this image, this image is, um, it's not the worst imaginable thing I can think of. Um, and that's what did it for me. Um, these people just needed some help. Uh, I decided then if, if I was asked again, I would, I would be going back. And it wasn't long before that call came. Uh, my second, sorry, go on, Zach. Uh, my second deployment was to the border region between Victoria and New South Wales along the banks of the Murray River. Um, it's a beautiful country there. Um, the area surrounding the small town of Gingellic was impacted by fire on, on New Year's Eve uh, before the fire crossed the border into Victoria. Um, on that night, they lost firefighter Sam McCall when his 14 tonne truck was picked up and thrown by a fire tornado. Uh, Sam was a local lad from the nearby land, town of Holbrook, um, which is where the rural fire service had set up the staging area for all the crews working on that fire. Um, it was our second day of, on that deployment, um, and it was another one of those catastrophic weather days uh, where you know, what was expected was that the fire would come back from, it, from Victoria and impact properties along the banks of the Murray. Uh, on that day, we were tasked to assess and um, defend properties along the river. And, you know, part of that is understanding whether the residents are staying or going. Um, we drove up to a property that had a, a sign made out of corrugated iron hanging on the front gate. Um, you know, and it said staying in, in bold. Uh, we got onto the property and spoke to the owners. Um, there was the, the man and wife couple that owned the place and some younger farm workers were there. They seemed pretty well organised. They had uh, machines, plenty of water, um, youth set up with uh, portable firefighting equipment on the back. Um, so we had a quick look around the property, um, asked them what their plan was and um, yeah, had, had a look around and 
sort of figured out what we thought we could do. Um, the husband and the young guys had planned that when the fire came down the hills, uh, they were going to go out onto the sort of um, floodplains and, and try and cut the fire off before it hit the property. Um, the wife was going to stay at the house um, and, and defend. If, if the young fellas weren't successful, they would all fall back to the house. Um, you know, we spoke to the captain about what we'd found and um, decided that we were going to stay with this property. So we set up set up to defend it that night. Um, you know, so we're standing there. We're standing there at the property um, at the house with the wife and the as I was talking about, the sky went black in the middle of the day. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, you know, and we're just waiting, waiting for the embers and the flames to come. Um, she starts telling us her story that on the night of uh, New Year's Eve, they had another property down the road um, and stayed to defend. They'd lost some outbuildings but saved the house. Uh, they had lost around 100 head of cattle, um, all burned to death. Um, you know, that night, you can imagine you know, sort of what they dealt with and, and the emotion of it all, um, but it took a lot out of them physically and emotionally. Uh, they spent the next couple of days digging holes and, and burying the cattle. You know, you could almost smell what she was talking about as she was describing it. Um, knowing the fire was coming back, they left the farm and came back to this property, uh, which they recently inherited. Um, there hadn't been anyone living there for quite some time, um, but they weren't going to lose that as well. Um, you know, she was really thankful about just having some people there to talk to, you know, knowing she didn't have to go through that again alone. Um, you know, things, things changed. The weather sort of wasn't um, as it was forecast to be, and, um, you know, that property was saved, um, and we took off to do the next job. Uh, but a couple of days later, the community had organised a bit of a get together on the on the footy oval. Um, you know, it, it was sort of a celebrating the danger of having passed, but also a the start of rebuilding. Um, everyone in the community was there. There was um, masseurs that had donated their time and driven from Melbourne. Um, you know, to set up in the community and give massages to sore and tired fires. There was a band from Melbourne. You know, someone brought in a, a massive smoking, uh, slow cooking barbecue. It was a real good old fashioned hoedown. Um, you know, we, we came in after our last shift for a cold beer and, and a bit of a rest. You know, they made us all very welcome. Uh, they got all the WA fireys up on stage to do some sort of ridiculous lot, uh, line dance. I think it was called the Get Up. Um, but, but everyone got a big laugh out of it. Uh, I think you can find that on YouTube. <laughs> if you'd like. Um, you know, you could tell it was a really important night from the community, built for the community to start healing and rebuilding, um, which will go on for a number of years. Um, I ran into that the, the wife again at the party, and it was, you know, everything had changed, and it was really good to see her again. You know, she got through that experience and relaxed and smiling. Um, you walk away from things like that knowing the community is going to be okay, that they've, they've got this sort of uh, connection, they'll look after each other to get through what they've, what they've suffered. Um, yeah, look, on the, on the subject of climate, I, I understand it's, it's quite a divisive issue, um, depending on who you talk to, the politicians have all got you know, their side of the story, but I'm 100% convinced that these fires were, were driven by the climate. Um, you know, the science and the fire experts are all alike. Over time, well, we have been seeing in this part of the country uh, de decreasing annual rainfall year on year. Um, you know, an increase in the number of days of, of the year above 35 degrees Celsius, generally higher average temperatures. We are going to see more severe weather events. Um, yeah, well, let's all be realistic about our expectations. I think I was um, I was preaching about climate change at the time, but um, let's say it's it's not the climate that starts the fires, but you know what you will see is much more severe fire behaviour under those conditions um, to the point where firefighters are not able to. There's nothing we can do.
much. Um, so the most important thing you can do, um, you, know, you live in these sorts of areas where you are exposed to bushfire risk, is to have a plan. You know, are you staying or going is the fundamental one. And if you're staying, um, does anyone else know what your plan is? What are your triggers, um, particularly for leaving? Um, you know, you can you can plan to stay and defend, but have some triggers down the track that um, that might change that strategy. Um, you know, from what I spoke about, I think it's clear you need to be physically and mentally prepared um, for what you'll experience in that sort of situation. How well have you prepared your property? Um, you know, who's going to help you or are you doing it alone? Have you got the right um, personal protective equipment, um, water supply and fire pumps and all this sort of stuff? Um, if it all does turn to custard, though, where are you going to go? What, what is your refuge place? There's a whole lot of things to think about, um, which is why the tools developed by DFES um, are really great to make it as simple for people as possible. Um, you know, also, as Chris spoke about, you cannot rely on a fire truck coming to your place. Um, in a major event, uh, resources are going to be spread very thin and uh, tough decisions might need to get made about where those resources are best utilised. Um, so look, the message at the end of that is, Plan for the worst and hope for the best. Um, thanks for listening, everyone. I'm happy to tell some more stories over a beer or two at some point. Um, Thank you, Keith. We appreciate you sharing your personal experiences and you should be really proud of your contribution. I'd like to say a big thank you to you and all our volunteers for all that you do to keep our community safe. Next, we have Sandy Chima. The oh, sorry. Before we jump to Sandy, do we have any questions that that have come through? No questions on the chat yet. I'd just like to remind everybody that if something pops up for you during a presentation, just write it in the chat, and, and I'm watching it, so you will be able to ask those questions directly after each presentation. Next, we have Sandy Chima, the DFES Community Preparedness Advisor, to talk about bushfire preparedness and the resources available. So welcome everyone, my name is Sandy Chima, I'm the Community Preparedness Advisor Southwest at DFES. Today, just get you the next slide. Today, within our session, we will look at know your risk, planning for fire, preparing your property, fire danger ratings, bushfire warning systems and information sources. So know your bushfire risk. More than 90% of West Australia is bushfire prone. If you live near bushfire, bushland, you are at risk of bushfire. Remember, bushland doesn't just mean trees and forest, it also includes areas of scrub or grassland. And even, and even if you don't live near the bush, embers can travel many kilometres ahead of a fire. So you could still be impacted by a bushfire, even if it's kilometres away. Firefighters will be busy fighting the fire, as we've already heard. They will not have time to knock on your door to tell you to leave. It is also important to remember that there will never be as many trucks as there are houses. It is your responsibility to reduce your risks and take action to survive a bushfire. It is really important to create a plan before. We've already heard this today. So I stress this, it is really important to create a plan before an emergency happens. Our brains do not can do funny things under pressure and we always don't make the best decisions when we're stressed. Knowing your plan in advance will help you to keep you and your family safer. Taking five minutes to improve or make a plan will give your property, your family and yourself the best chance of survival should you be threatened by a bushfire. It walks, it walks you through the decision-making process for your fire planning so that you and your family can make an informed decision about whether to be safe and leave early or be prepared to stay and defend. There are a number of tools you can use to create your bushfire plan. As we've already heard, DFES website, fire chat, and the bushfire preparation toolkit is one source. 
both the website and the toolkit will ask you to answer a series of questions to help you determine whether you want to, to be safe and leave early or prepare to stay and defend. Once you've decided whether to stay or leave, you can use it, the appropriate section of the website or bushfire preparation toolkit to create your plan. Now we're just going to watch a video. Okay, this is a video. Um, is that a video? It should be. All the should other be. ones would be videos like that. Um, Not linking in. It's just a lot of this computer. This one. While we're waiting, um, if people have not seen the big weather, it's on ABC iView. On ABC, you can still um, watch the ABC iView. There are other videos that you may want to watch. Um, we're going to be talking in a moment about packing for an emergency kit. And there is an example on YouTube. Uh, it's called YouTube Big Weather um, to do with evac uh, packing. Ready to evacuate. Ready to evacuate, yes. But I highly recommend to have a look at the YouTube Big Weather ABCI view. So this one with the step four. Yes. Yeah. This video could save your life. Three. Have a backup plan in play. A push button. This video could save your life. A bushfire survival plan will help you take action and avoid making last minute decisions that could prove deadly during a bushfire. So gather the family around and complete the following steps. 1. Know the fire danger rates and bushfire warning systems. Stay informed, monitor local conditions, and be prepared to make your own decisions. 2. Discuss what you do with bushfire threats your own. Will you be safe and leave early, or be prepared to stay in defend your property? Once your household is agreed on a plan, be sure to write it down and display it where everyone can see. Three, have a backup plan in place if things don't go to plan. Consider different scenarios, like if you're away from your property, if you're home alone, or if you have guests over, and plan your responses accordingly. Four, know where you can shelter safely if there is a sudden change in your bushfire survival plan. If sheltering in a building, make sure the room has an internal and external exit, like a laundry. You may also shelter safely outside in an area that has already been burnt, like a paddock. Planning for a bushfire is easier than you think. You can't outrun it or outlast it, so plan to outsmart it. For more tips, visit dfest.wa.gov.au forward slash watch. This video could save your life. A bushfire survival plan will help you. So we'll go back to the slide deck just now. So this is from the packing and emergency kit slide. Oh, sorry. So part of your bushfire plan is also packing an emergency kit. In addition to creating your plan, it is important to make a pack an emergency kit, or some people might have heard of a grab bag. Having a kit prepared can save precious time during an emergency and ensure you have all the essentials. Remember, our brains don't always make the best decisions under stress, so you may end up with essential items missing if you don't prepare in advance. If your plan is to be safe and leave early, you may be away from your home for several days. If your plan is to be prepared to stay and defend, you may lose access to utilities 
like power, gas or water. Make sure your emergency kit is well stocked with essential items. For example, portable battery operated AM FM radio with extra batteries, as we've already heard this morning today. First aid kit and manual, essential medications, copies of important documents, scanned and save these documents on a USB stick to include in your kit, and non-perishable food items and can openers are just some examples. Preparing your property. Whether you plan to stay or leave, there are a number of things you can do to prepare your property and reduce your risk. The Bushfire Preparation Toolkit, an online platform, contains information to help you prepare your property. Property preparation should be undertaken all year round. In fact, many of the tasks you undertake to prepare your property for bushfire will help reduce you, your risk from other hazards such as storms. Understanding fire danger ratings. An important part of preparing yourself and your family for bushfire is understanding the fire danger ratings. It is a common misconception that fire danger ratings tell us how likely a fire will occur on a given day. However, this is not true. Fire danger, danger ratings actually tell us how dangerous a fire will be if one starts. If the fire danger rating is low to moderate or high and a fire starts, it can almost likely be controlled and homes can provide safety. On low, moderate or high fire danger days, you should check your bushfire survival plan and monitor conditions. If a fire starts, you may, you may need to put your plan into action. If a fire occurs when the fire danger is very high, well-prepared homes that are actively defended can provide safety. safety. If you plan to stay and defend, you must, must have the equipment and resources to put fires out around your home. Be vigilant, check your fire plan and continue to monitor conditions as they change quickly. If the fire on a day when the rating is severe is more uncontrollable, only stay to defend if you are prepared to the highest level. Check your bushfire survival plan and continue to monitor conditions as they change quickly. On extreme fire days, if a fire starts, it will be uncontrollable, unpredictable and fast moving. Homes that are specifically constructed or modified to withstand a bushfire that are well prepared and actively defended may provide safety. Only stay and defend if you are prepared at the highest level. When the fire danger is catastrophic, these are the worst conditions for a bush or a grass fire. Homes are not designed or constructed to withstand fires in these conditions. The safest place is to be away from high risk bushfire areas, even if your normal plan is to stay and defend. When a fire threatens, another part of preparing for bushfire is learning how to respond if a bushfire does threaten. There are a number of information sources you can use when putting your plan into action. On the screen is a list of sources you can use to keep you up to date with reliable information when a bushfire threatens. Keep in mind that you may need several sources available to you. If main power is lost, you could lose access to your internet and landline telephone. If you have a mobile phone or a battery powered radio, make sure you keep spare batteries on hand. If you lose power at home and you don't know know your mobile phone or portable radio, what's one place you can think of where you can still access the radio? You can hear you ticking away thinking, that's right, the car. Other than your surroundings, all the sources listed on the previous slide provide information based on the alerts and warnings which make up your bushfire warning system. These alerts and warnings will provide you with information about the fire to help you decide what to do to stay and to stay safe. No matter where you live or work in the Shire of Dardana, it is important to understand the different alert levels in the bushfire warning systems and what they mean. Today we'll show you how the alerts and warnings appear on the Emergency WA website. This picture on the screen above shows the desktop view of Emergency WA. You can see the information in that view and the list down the side. If you 
have location services turn on your phone or computer. And then even click on the locate me button on the top right, right of the screen and the map will zoom to your location. I'm going to do a spot the difference. So what I'd like you to do is post this occasion to actually go onto the emergency WA website and look at a spot the difference. I'll give you a clue. There's a total fire ban and an FDR button on the top banner that is not showing up on this screen here. So your job to go and have a look at the emergency WA website. Conversely, the view shown on this slide is the version you will see on your mobile device. You can still see the map or list view. You will just need to select your preference and menu across the top. This particular image shows a fire where three of the bushfire warning alerts were current. Let's go through what each of them mean. The bushfire warning system has four alert levels, advice, watch and act, emergency warning, and all clear. These three levels provide information on the severity of the bushfire and the risk it poses to lives and properties. The advice, the blue section in the map, is a fire that is started, but there is no immediate threat to lives or homes. Stay alert and watch for signs of fire. Watch and act, the yellow, which is not a watch and wait see. A fire is approaching and is out of control. There is a plausible threat to lives and homes. Put your plan into action now. If your plan is to leave, leave now. If your plan is to stay, only do so if you're mentally, physically, and emotionally prepared to defend your property and have the right equipment. The emergency warning, which is in the red, an out of control fire is approaching very fast. You must act now to survive. If you haven't prepared your home, it is too late. You must leave now. It is safe to do if it is safe to do so. So, all clear, which is the clear section. The danger has passed and the fire is under control, but you need to remain vigilant in case the situation changes. As we've already heard, indecision is what kills lives. Within the alert, you will find lots of information about the bushfire. For example, the, the fire behavior, what to do, road closures, evacuation center locations and more. This is the best source for accurate information about the fire. And this is just a video on the alerts and warnings. I'll just switch over to the video now, one moment. Just need to find it in the player here. This thing. Okay, just sharing the screen. Video can serve your life. DFIS and the Parks and Wildlife Service at the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions issue warnings for bushfires that have the potential to threaten lives and properties. So it's important to understand the bushfire warning system and know what to do at each level. Advice. There is no immediate danger, but you need to stay alert and informed in case the situation changes. Watch and act. There is a possible threat to lives and homes. Conditions are changing and you need to leave the area or prepare to actively defend your home. Emergency warning. You are in danger and you need to act immediately to survive. Listen carefully as you will be advised if it's safe to leave the area or if you need to take shelter. All clear. The danger has passed but you need to stay vigilant in case the situation changes. In a life-threatening emergency, or if you see fire and cannot see emergency services nearby, call triple zero immediately. Remember, your safety is your responsibility. Don't wait for an official warning or a text message before you act. To stay up to date during an emergency, visit emergency.wa.gov.au. So, so where to from here? So now that you have all this information, where to from here? Go online to create your bushfire plan. 
on the dfest.wa.gov.au slash forward slash fire chat or complete your plan using the hard copy bushfire preparation toolkit. You can contact the Shire, your local FCO or myself for a hard copy. So one, create your bushfire. Two, pack your emergency kit. Three, prepare your property. Remember, there's information to help you do this in the Bushfire Preparation Toolkit and on the Fire Check website, as well as contact with your local uh, Bushfire Brigade. Get familiar with the Emergency WA website. So there's four activities that I'd like you to do. What more? Want more? Ask me about joining a Bushfire Ready Group, a community-led program that helps neighbours to work together to prepare and protect their families and properties from bushfire. This is another video now. Yep, let me just switch over to the video player. One moment. This one is called Prepare Your Home. Yes. So just to reiterate, I've asked you to do four tasks. One is the bushfire plan. Two is the emergency kit, preparing your bread bag. Three is preparing your property. And four is familiarising yourself with the emergency WA website. Thanks, we're ready to watch the video now. This video has been safe. Bushfires move fast, even faster uphill, and they can generate enough heat to melt metal. So you need to prepare your home to give it the best chance of surviving the fire. Here are some important things you can do around your property. Trim long grass, prune shrubs, and remove any resting against the house. Remove wood, mulch, or any flammable material that gets on near the house. Create a minimum two meter gap between your house and tree branches. Block gaps on the floor, Roof spaces, eaves, vents, skylights, chimneys, clay. Also, install metal flywire mesh on all windows and vents, plus a protective screen when evaporating air conditioning. By following these few simple steps, you'll give your home the best possible chance of surviving the bushfire. Start today. For more tips, visit dfest.wa. Are there any questions? Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat just yet. Um, just reminders to you guys, if you think of anything during the presentations, just write it in the chat. We'd be happy to address them at the end of the presentation. Um, but as we haven't got any more, we'll just pass back to Erin. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Some fantastic preparedness information and resources readily available to us all. Now the Shire's Emergency Management Officer, Melissa Howell, would share what mitigation works that are currently being implemented across the Shire to help reduce our risk. Sorry. Okay, I'm Zach signing the presentation. Hi everyone, obviously um, I'm here today to talk about bushfire risk management and how the Shire manages risk within the lands we're responsible for. Uh, this includes up to 400 properties, 200 properties that um, we directly uh, look after and another 200 properties that are invested in the Shire of Dana, which makes us responsible. And okay, we're off. So, first slide, yes. So, first of all, we'll look at emergency risk management in terms of its overarching way. Um, it's it's a process, a way that we 
measure our risk, such as bushfire, flood and storm. It is a systematic process which contributes to the well-being of the community and the environment. The process considers the likely effects of the hazardous event and controls by which they can be minimised. So let's take a look at a quick video of what our community is striving to achieve in the, uh, managing risks across our state. We'll just open up the video, one sec. This is Majestic W. Expansive land with twisting computers, beautiful dark cities, and of course, us. Unfortunately, like every bear in the world, sometimes things can get it wrong. Which could have negative effects in our lives. Endless pot of money, we can manage everything. Realistically, our pot of money is not endless, and we need to use it wisely. Thankfully, the chances and impact of some hazards can be far low. So the risk of the state may also be low. But we can't say which are the highest or lowest risks and where they can occur unless we measure them. In 2013, the state measured how seven natural hazards affected our families economy, environment, and infrastructure. Now, the State Emergency Management Committee will measure the risks faced by 27 individual hazards. To achieve this, we will work together at three different levels within the state. Together, we will use the common measurement process so we can effectively compare different risks across the state. From the measuring process, we will have risk assessment for state, district, and local levels. Once measured, this will allow us to invest our money effectively into pre planning, prevention, and mitigation of hazards that pose the greatest threat. In order to achieve this, we will be working with public and private organizations across the state. Together, we can make WA a safer place for everybody. The State Risk Project, brought to you by the State Emergency Management Committee. Right, I'm just going to change back to the slides for a moment. Perfect. Should we go to the next slide? Yes, thanks, sir. Okay, so looking on the right, that is basically an illustration of the emergency risk management process. Um, this is defined in our Australian New Zealand standards, which is the 31,000-2009 risk management principles and guidelines. So this is what we use this process in assessing our bushfire risk. Um, the objectives, obviously, of risk management is to effectively manage bushfire related in in order to protect people, assets, and the environment. Document the process used to identify, analyze, and evaluate risk, to determine the priorities, and then develop a plan to systematically treat the risk. The Shire of Dartnup has developed a bushfire risk management plan in 2018, and we're now implementing the treatments identified in this plan. Bushfire risk management is a shared responsibility. As dictated in that video, you can see that local governments will be working with landowners, other agencies, and um, contractors. Next slide, Jack. So just to give you a little bit of the history of the bushfire risk management, West Australia has experienced its fair share of devastating bushfires over the last decade. 
You can see in the purple where our last slides are, the top one there is the Runa Yarloop fire, the bottom one is the Esperance fires. After each fire, the inquiry has been undertaken to understand the cause and how we can do better at preparing for and responding to bushfires. One of the repeating recommendations that coming up in each of these inquiries is to the need to manage fuels in our bushlands more effectively. Climate change, of course, is contributing to this and we are drying out um, as the southwest corner of WA. Uh, in the last, over the last 50 years, our rainfall has decreased by 20%. So next slide. So coming out of those inquiries and as time has flipped on and we've had our experiences, our government has put together a mitigation activity fund, um, which let's have a look here. So through Royalties of Regions program has been specifically allocated to expand the treatment of bushfire risk associated with state held lands located in and around regional town sites to further reduce the risk to life property in these communities. Mass supports activities that build the fire management capacity and overall resilience for regional communities. It targets on-ground treatments that address extreme, very high and high bushfire risks on state-owned or managed lands located within adjacent to regional town sites across WA. Since 2017, the state government has funded 37 local governments to carry out more than 2,500 mitigation activities, a contribution of well over 20 million in creating a safe WA. Next slide. So under the first round of mitigation in 2019-2020, the Shire of Dardana received $209,000 to carry out 42 treatments. You can see a picture of Maori Reserve in Eaton there where we redone the access way tracks or fire breaks um, that is between properties and that area of bushland. Altogether, $6 million has been allocated to this set um, to mitigation activities for 2020 and 21. The City of Mandurah received 318,000 for 38 treatments. The City of Busterton received 499,000 for 36 treatments. Shire of Margaret River, 345,034 treatments. And coming up to us, the Shire of Dardanup, we've received 492,000 this year to, to uh, implement 39 treatments. The types of treatments that we are implementing is obviously fire access tracks, parkland clearing, which can be seen in the right-hand photos. That's a picture of, of Charterhouse Street. Uh, you can see how much sort of uh, bush and, and shrubbery is in between the trees and we've completely cleared that now. We also do spraying and pruning using hand crews in less accessible areas. And of course we do prescribed burning. Our latest burn we carried out behind the Dardanelle Cemetery on Garby Road. Um, and yeah, so that's basically what we've been up to this year. There is funding for next year. Um, if there's anything you would like to bring to the Shire's attention of lands that we own or are um, responsible for, please don't hesitate to send the Shire an email because we will have a look at it for you if we haven't included it already. Thanks. So just to look at what our um, outside crew or our depot staff do, and they do this all year, every year. Um, they do slashing and spraying of the roadside verges. They do install fire access tracks on our reserves and uh, certain areas behind urban population. And of course, they're responsible for irrigating our urban parks and reserves that all contribute to um, reducing bushfire risk around our towns. And, and that's, um, that's it. Thank you. Just jump over and see if we have any questions. No questions just yet. And I'll say once again, guys, if you do have any questions and you'd like to ask some of our presenters anything, just chuck your questions in the chat box and we'll be happy to address them after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. I know the whole Shire team have been working really hard with our volunteers as well as other contractors across the Shire in preparation for the fire season. Now, I know a lot of people in our community want to reduce their risk of bushfire and still like to have a beautiful garden. 
but may be unsure how. Our next presenter is the Shire's Environmental Officer, Jack Nicholl, who will share with us how we can achieve this. Thanks, Jackie. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a beautiful day out here. Um, apologies, I'm checking in from home. Um, so thank you for letting me, me speak. Um, I think I've got a screen somewhere, which hopefully Zach is pulling up. Yeah, Jackie, yeah, I'm just loading it up on the screen now and I'll start sharing the first slide. In Great, thank five you. Seconds. So we actually uh, have a two hour workshop on the 18th of um, this month. And that will cover a lot of what I'm going to talk about in greater detail today, um, because I, I just have a, a few minutes to tell you a little bit about what's um, happening. And hopefully it's just a taster for what can happen down the track. Can everyone hear me? I don't know whether you can see me or not. Yeah, Jackie, you're, you're up on the screen. You're, you're a little box on the corner. I've got your first slide up on the screen. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, so we might just switch over to the next one if that's okay, Zach. Yep. <clears throat> so just, just to let you know, um, there are plenty of things that you can do to manage um, fire in your in and around your home um, obviously there's more things you can do um, there's different slightly different things you can do if you're in a rural area versus um, being in a town site or um, in an urban area but a lot of the processes are the same um, and it really is about good planning and um, and thinking and you know not being alarmed but being informed so a good planned garden um, is designed, uh, I noticed in some of your other presentations about talking about how fire moves through the landscape. So we want to look at that when we're doing uh, a good design. Um, so if we can just flip over to the next one. Um, yeah. So there's, there's four basic principles. I'm going to talk a little bit about these in a bit more detail. Um, but the, the first thing to think about is really how a fire does move. So um, starting from the ground up, obviously, usually most fires start from the ground up um, and you want to be able to think about how they actually move horizontally and vertically. Um, so if you can separate your garden into different zones or different areas, um, then you can actually stop the fire if you if, if a fire is coming from transitioning from one of those areas to another area or closer to your home. So in in um, in this picture um, you can see there um, you can see that um, the garden has certain um, substances on the ground or you know mulches and and wood chips and gravel and those sorts of things make a big difference in relation to the fire actually moving horizontally. So we're going to look at some of these a little bit more detail. So the next slide we're going to look at pockets and paths. Thank you. Um, so creating different spaces around your garden. If you can separate your garden into different sections, like in the picture above, um, in the top picture, um, you can see that it's still a beautiful garden, but it's got a nice big pathway through the middle of it. And the garden is actually in a small bed. And, you know, it's got some low plants in that small bed. So that means that if a fire comes through or starts in that bed, it's going to hit the gravel or the pathway before it really goes anywhere. So that's really the first principle. And these other two photos are examples of, um, also from dry parts of the world, where you can use different materials in your garden to plan. So um, paths are really good, pockets, pockets of gardens, raised beds, like in the picture um, down the bottom where you've actually got a hard surface on the ground and your um, beautiful flowering plants and things are actually raised up. Um, that's a good way to actually halt the fire from moving. Um, and it can't get terribly hot because you've separated those areas out. So um, 
in the other picture, you can see that they've actually used rocks. So they've used a, um, a, a lots of rocks in a rock garden, and that also slows the movement of fire down because it will hit those obviously hard surfaces that are really hard to burn. So um, it's quite um, hard to cram in all this information in just a few slides, but hopefully you can get a bit of an idea that um, pockets and paths is a really easy way to sort of think about your garden space around your home and um, breaking that those areas up using different materials can create a lot of interest and make your garden very beautiful, but it can also mean that a fire is not going to get established and really zoom through your garden space. So if we flip to the next slide, um, this is a, sort of a bit more of a follow on from that theme. Now, both of these photos are from Australian gardens. You can see in the um, photo on the left hand side that um, these people have bushland right next door to their garden. But what they've actually done is separate that bushland from their garden space. And they've done that using a lot of different techniques. Now, if you manicure and maintain grass and it's watered um, and it's very low, then grass is pretty hard to burn hot. It will still burn, but it's not going to create a, a huge wildfire and get up into that canopy um, because it's reticulated and it's low and it's maintained. Um, the other thing about that garden, you can see that there's lots of rock, rock, <coughs> excuse me, and there's that uh, wall around the back of the property. Oh, all of those things are separating taller vegetation from smaller vegetation in front of it. So it's good to get the gaps. So when I talk about gaps, I mean, if you think of, bush, of a bushland, bushland has a number of different layers in it. So there's ground covers, and then there's a layer in between or a mid-story. Um, and then above the mid story is a taller story of trees. And when that canopy, when that um, structure of that vegetation is all connected, it's very easy for a fire to move from the ground to that mid story and up into the canopy, climbing the trees. So um, in your garden space, if you can separate those layers out, you can still have interest and make your garden beautiful. And don't be frightened of trees, and I'm going to talk a bit more about trees later, but you can actually put trees in your garden as long as you separate them out. So if you look at the picture on the right, you can see there's a tree in the very background. It's actually in an open area. It's providing shade. Um, it's um, providing interest and it's, you know, a lovely tree, but it doesn't have any mid-story or understory really next to it. It's got some hard surfaces nearby and some other interesting plants in front of it, but quite a way away. And those plants are very low growing. So you can see that there's a bit of a gap between the ground covers and the tall trees. And you want to establish those kinds of gaps if you're in a really fire prone area and you're concerned about fire around your house. Having those gaps means that if a fire does come, um, then it's going to find it difficult to move from one area to another because of the paving or the grass or the mulch, but it's also going to find it hard because it's not able to transition between the low growing areas and the mid story and the high story because there's gaps. So that's just a very simple explanation on big gaps. So our next um, slide, is uh, thinking about some of the species that we can use. So some plants are more resilient to being burnt than others. Some plants are more flammable than others. It's a simple fact. And um, in this country, we do have um, species that are quite prone to um, burning pretty easily. And they would be our eucalypts, things that are high in oil content. Um, so one of the ways in which you can minimise this is actually thinking about where your plant has come from and using species that are more appropriate um, and less likely to burn. So in Western Australia, we do have a lot of native plants. So these are our local 
endemic plants, the plants that are found in our region, only found in our region, nowhere else on earth. And these plants are grown mostly on the coast because they have very small leaves, they have a low oil content and they have a really high um, salt content often because they're very salt tolerant because they grow on our coastline. So often they're grey coloured plants. Um, so if you go for a walk down the beach, you'll often see those grey foliage plants, very small leaves. They are actually fire res resistant, if you like. So um, a lot of those species on the coast also are quite high in water. So sometimes they can be a little bit succulent, um, or almost like cactus-like or um, juicy. <laughs> um, and they're also good because they're, they're harder to light as well. So there's a list of lots of different species. I can give this uh, list to anyone who's interested, obviously. Um, but we will be covering this in more detail when we do the two hour workshop in a few weeks. Um, so that's some native plants and they're very beautiful. You don't need to have an ugly garden. You can certainly have a cottage like garden um, and lots of colour and beauty. Um, but it's, it's good to use some of these more fire wise um, species. So if we flip to our next slide, um, we've got a, a number of species, again, that are very similar, but they're not native. So these are our, our more cottagey plants. They're our cacti and our succulents. A lot of normal grass, if, as I said, if it's maintained. Um, fescue and mondo. Um, so the picture down the bottom, just above our Shire logo, is some mondo grass planted in clumps. Looks a little bit like, a, it's almost like a... Um, well, I guess it's a type of grass, but it, uh, to me, that's quite a beautiful form. So you can create some beautiful spaces and places in your garden using those sorts of materials. Now, a lot of non-native plants that are um, good for um, being firewise are also the Mediterranean herbs. So um, again, they grow in hot climates. Uh, they have very small narrow leaves and they often have bluey coloured, grey blue coloured foliage. So that would be things like thyme, rosemary, so long as the rosemary doesn't get too tall, chamomile and nasturtiums and salvia. So the picture down at the bottom with the red flower, that's some salvia. Um, pretty water wise and you can create a beautiful cottage feel with these sorts of species. Of course, you can also grow a lot of creepers. Um, they are quite um, fire resilient, a lot of them. So that would be wisteria, ivy, grapes, um, and jasmine. So those sorts of things, um, as long as you keep them tidy and trimmed, which I'm also going to talk about, um, those sorts of species are, are quite good to resist fire and will often come back after fire too. So if you did end up having an area burnt, you will eventually get those species back. So next slide, we're going to be talking a little bit more about trees. Now, I know that there's a lot of concern in the community about fire and there's also, um, there seems to be a bit of a push um, in some parts of the community um, where they feel that trees are not necessary and that we really should be trying to get rid of them because they're potentially a fire hazard and there's lots of potentially other things wrong with trees. But this slide is to really tell you we really desperately need trees, especially in urban areas. Um, but we also need them on our land um, because um, it's not just us who likes trees, it's also a lot of stock. And trees provide a lot of shade and a lot of very important things. So this slide just um, explains to you uh, that the temperature changes with trees as opposed to an area without trees in the middle of summer. And you can imagine how hot it can get coming off all that pavement. So in those really hot fire conditions, we want the um, areas to be cooled and um, trees can provide that. So I guess it's just a plea <laughs> from the environment officer to please um, continue to think of trees because trees are very important and we really do need them in our landscape. Um, but the way of dealing with them is to try and uh, space them out so they're not too close together and make sure, like in the picture below, 
um, the, the underneath picture, there's actually nothing between the overstory and the ground. So there's very little um, ladder fuel is what it's called, that area in between. Um, so, sorry, I'm just gonna hang on a moment. <laughs> sorry about that, it's a very noisy dog next door. Um, so, um, Think about the species of tree, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, but before we leave that, I just wanted to say deciduous trees are very important. So our native trees aren't deciduous. Deciduous means they drop their leaves in winter. Um, now, those sorts of trees usually don't come from this part of the world, but they do serve a really important purpose for designing around sustainable gardening and making sure that your house is um, cool in summer and warm in winter. Um, so they allow in winter light and they also um, get rid of um, too much summer, hot summer sun. So deciduous plants are really important to grow and trees, if you're going to have a tree close to your house, it would be really good to have a deciduous tree close to your house. Um, put the Australian trees the native trees a little bit further away from your house because they do have that high oil content. So if we have a closer look at trees on the next slide. Hello. Yep. Oh, it's gone. Okay. <laughs> um, so some of the trees that we need to look at, um, it depends on where you locate the trees um, on your property. So this is um, I'm not sure if this is my last slide or not, but um, well, keeping it clean, I think this is, sorry? Sorry, um, it should be displaying a slide with a house, one house on it and some circles around it. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, I can see that, but I'm, miss, I'm missing a slide, but that's okay. Uh, I'll just talk to this one. So I believe this has been covered a little bit in some of the videos that you watched a bit earlier, but you can see that removing things like stacked firewood, raking things from um, around the base of your house, making sure that your eaves are clean. And if you're going to have any trees and they're those um, deciduous trees, they're the ones to have a little closer to your house, knowing that, of course, over winter they will drop all their leaves. So you need to make sure that those leaves are raked and stowed away in time for summer. And they will, of course, green up by summer. Um, and that will cool your house, um, but they are less fire prone than their native plants. So native trees, you move to that further um, ring that you can see on this plan, have them further away from your house and also space them um, further apart so that they're not going to crown. So if you have trees spaced far enough apart so that you still have tree and they still provide shade and cover and interest, but they're not so close together that they're going to, if one is, um, catches fire, then the rest of them will also become flammable as well. So um, keeping it clean, it's been talked about a bit before, but it's really important in gardening, especially um, as summer is approaching, to make sure that your, um, your garden and your house around you is prepared for the a fire if it's coming and that all that flammable loose dry material is pruned and removed and taken away and um, it's neat and clean so that you know when you start to run your um, so you're prepared for summer. So um, just on to the next slide if we have any more. Yeah so this is the last slide just to let you know about our um, this <coughs> covered in greater detail. Um, it's our fire and gardening workshop um, on the 18th of November, um, 10 to 12. So we really welcome lots of discussion and lots of opportunities um, on that day to discuss um, how we can help make your garden beautiful, but also suitable for um, preparing for the come, uh, coming um, fire season. So. Thank you very much for letting me speak. And um, yeah, if I've got any questions, I'm really happy to assist. Yeah, I'll just jump over to the questions. Um, yeah, we don't have any questions just yet, um, but once again, guys, you're welcome just to write in there whenever you like, and we'll address those questions for you. We will have a Q and A session at the end where I think I'll just take everybody off mute 
and you can just chime in if you have a question. It may be a lot easier for everyone. Uh, so we'll pass back to you, Aaron. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Your passion for our native flora and fauna is invaluable. And um, oh, there you are. So, um, so thanks so much for your time today with that. And um, I think there'll be lots of people interested in this upcoming workshop. So I hope that goes well. I hope so. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Zach, so if, do we don't have any further questions? No questions. Okay. So if anyone does think of any further questions after we finish today, please contact us here at the Shire Direct and we'll uh, try and assist you. Um, that brings us to the end of uh, today's webinar. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you. We do apologise about the connection issues that we have had throughout. Um, today. So it has been a pleasure being with everyone today. Thanks to our presenters for making yourselves available. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Um, thanks to Zach for all your assistance with all the technical issues that we've had today. Um, and thanks again um, everyone for joining us today. And if you'd like to see today's webinar again, it will be made available on the Shire of Darden YouTube channel. So just a uh, last thank you to everyone.